Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the second breakfast briefing of 2017. My name is Hunter Hill. I'm a member of the BGR Board of Directors and Chairman of the Breakfast Briefing Committee. We're happy to welcome BGR members and all of our guests to this morning's event. We have a number of elected officials who have joined us today. Thank you for your public service and essential support of our work. Very often, you translate BGR's work into real results. BGR is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research firm dedicated to inform public policymaking and the effective use of public resources. We publish influential, award winning policy reports and monitor more than 70 government entities across Jefferson, Orleans, and St. Tammany parishes. BGR's goal is the improvement of government in the greater New Orleans area. Breakfast briefings provide a critical opportunity to fulfill BGR's mission by allowing citizens and policymakers to discuss issues that affect all of our lives. We hope you will take advantage of the question and answer portion of today's program. You can see the simple instructions about how to use the Slido app or website uh, to submit questions on your table. If you prefer to write your question on paper, feel free to do so, and we'll come around and pick them up. Uh, include your name, please, if you'd like to be identified. We also welcome ideas for future breakfast briefing topics. We're going to have a couple more this year, one of which we have identified a topic. The other one is wide open, so please uh, submit ideas. You'll find the suggestion cards on your table. If you want to uh, jot something down and leave it with us on the way out, that would be excellent. Uh, but the best way to stay on top of all BGR events and research is to become a member. This year, we're putting extra emphasis on building our member base and increasing dialogue with all of our members. Our members are an essential tool for amplifying BGR's good government recommendations. So if you're not currently a member, please consider joining the ranks of concerned citizens working to improve local government. We're now offering a host of new member benefits and increasing the overall value of BGR's membership. And now to introduce our topic this morning, I'd like to welcome to the podium Dennis Woltering. Uh, many of you know Dennis as WWL-TV's former anchor. He continues his community service and is an active member of the BGR board. Dennis. Thank you, Hunter. I'd like to take this opportunity to express gratitude to Iberia Bank for its generous sponsorship of BGR's breakfast briefing series in 2017. Their support allows BGR to make these events free and open to the public. The Port of New Orleans is a key element in our local story. It's the reason the city came to be 300 years ago after Bienville realized that the bend in the river would make one of the world's finest locations for a port city. It has been a centerpiece of our economy ever since. But over the years, the maritime commerce has expanded and contracted. The footprint of the port has grown. The modes of transportation have remained in flux. The question for today is, where do we go from here? To discuss the latest developments at the port as well as the future and what it may hold is Brandy Christian, President and CEO of the Port of New Orleans. Ms. Christian joined the Port of New Orleans in 2015 as Chief Operating Officer. Before that, she was COO, and before that, she served 14 years at the Port of San Diego, where she led efforts to streamline the public agency's operational processes. She also worked for KPMG Consulting as a quality management consulting consultant in their public sector practice. She holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Southern California and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Arizona, which in 2015 named her Alumna of the Year. Thanks for joining us this morning, Ms. Christian. The floor is yours. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for getting up at the crack of dawn. I, uh, my, uh, as my staff knows, I have a few here today. I was traveling last week. I've been in Asia, so I'm still on a completely different time zone. So I really appreciate you making it out this morning. Um, I wanted to do some quick introductions. As I mentioned, my staff is here. I'd also like to recognize our chairman, Mike Kearney, and Commissioner Tara Hernandez with the Port of New Orleans. You know, I was excited when I, we got the opportunity offered to be here this morning with BGR. The work that BGR does to ensure effective public management is really essential 
and um, is mentioned in my bio. You know, it's funny from a background perspective, people always ask, how did you get into the maritime industry? You know, and I often tell them I got into the port industry by chance. I got into the public sector by choice. I was one of those rare people that in my first class in college, a political science elective, I completely fell in love with the notion of the public sector in government and really thought, you know, you can make such an impact. And my journey along the way, it, um, you know, it was just life as it does, is introduces new opportunities. And I started focusing my career on making public organizations more effective through quality management, et cetera. And I had this great opportunity with a port. I you know, didn't really know what a port was. We ran the airport, we ran the seaport, um, and I completely fell in love with the industry because the port industry is a really complex industry. Because on one hand, you're a public agency. You have all of the red tape and the, the you live in a fishbowl. You have to be accountable to the community. And every single one of your customers is from the private sector. So we live in both worlds, and we have to manage that um, very well on behalf of the community, but also servicing our customers. So to me, it's just a dynamic um, type of industry to work in. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is just a little bit of an update on the Port of New Orleans, some of the changes that we're going through, and where we're heading as an organization. So with that, I'm going to jump into a bit of a presentation. For those of you um, that may not be as familiar with the Port of New Orleans, you know, this is funny. The Port of New Orleans, our connections run deep. You know, we actually um, started using this slogan as more of a marketing term because some of our competitors like to spread rumors that the Mississippi River is not deep enough for Panamax ships. So we wanted to make it clear, no, we can receive those ships. But as we thought about it, into Dennis's introduction is our connections run deep in a number of ways. Yes, in the maritime world, we have customers across the globe that service and come through the port of New Orleans, but also we're, we're extremely tied to this community, not just this community, the state and um, national level with the economic development and jobs that are created. So many people de depend on the, on the products that move through this port. And lastly, we're connected to the community. As Dennis said, New Orleans was founded in order to accomplish and take advantage of this amazing Mississippi River and to move commerce on it. So we are completely tied to the community. And you'll see a little bit later in my presentation that we're really trying to focus on that factor. Um, as a port, it is very difficult in our industry. People, most people, they know what ports are, but after 9-11, we're kind of hidden behind a secure fence. You can't see it, you can't touch it, and when I moved to New Orleans, I said, oh boy, we also are hidden behind a wall. And so that's even a bigger challenge for us. So we've done a lot of work to bring people behind the wall, see the operations, but we too, as an organization, have to come out from behind the wall. We have to be part of the solution. We have to be part of the conversation. So you'll see a tremendous amount of focus in our planning to do just that. So what does the Port of New Orleans do? We're called what you would call a landlord port, meaning that we partner with the private sector to bring in capital to help build infrastructure um, in three lines of business, cargo. So in our cargo arenas, we move boxes, containers, and also products that don't fit into boxes. And we also move um, people through our cruise business. We are now the sixth busiest cruise port in the United States with about a million passengers. And lastly, we have real estate holdings, over a thousand acres where um, we're doing a lot of planning about, around how do those acres, how do those facilities actually help provide value, help facilitate more movement of cargo. And um, as an entity, you know, as we kind of joke here in Louisiana, we have to eat what we catch because we live on our own revenues, we don't tax, we have to be extremely efficient and the infrastructure around ports and maritime is extremely expensive. And I have to tell you, coming from the West Coast, it's even more expensive to build on the Mississippi River because of the soil issues and the bank issues. So it's really important that we think very strategically about where our funds go. This is a very difficult map to see, but essentially um, it just lays out the region. The Port of New Orleans has jurisdiction in Orleans Parish, Jefferson Parish, and St. Bernard Parish. 
The majority of our facilities are in New Orleans, um, the Uptown Wharves, over by the French Quarter, and then all of the real estate and some cargo facilities along the Industrial Canal. So in trying to translate to people, you know, what does the port mean to you? Like I said, it's such a technical industry. How do you get access to it? What does it mean to you? Do you know everything in this room, every product, 90% of all products move through a port before they get to their destination. So what it means to the, the constituent, to the public, is all the products that we move. So we are a big, big exporter of frozen chicken. And with that, you can make 660 chicken pot pies. We move tons of plastics and resins. And what happens with those plastics and resins, we push them out as an export. They go to all over the globe, Europe, Asia. They make plastic shampoo bottles, plastic toys, you name it, and it comes back as a consumer. So this is just an example of what it means. And as I mentioned, our mission really is economic development. That's why we were formed. That's what we focus on. And what we you know, really think about in terms of the jobs that it creates, it creates about one in five jobs in the region. But more important to us, if you look at the second note, the jobs that are created through the port in maritime are 37% higher wages than the average uh, type of job in New Orleans. So these are quality jobs, they're family sustaining um, jobs. And so it's extremely important that we continue to drive that kind of economic development for the region. We also are a, a contractor. So when you talk about economic impact and you know, how does employment work, we directly hire people, our tenants hire people, the shipping companies, the cruise lines, but also we contract for services, engineering, professional services. And we've had a very big focus on uh, rebuilding and centralizing our procurement process to make it easier, make it more clear to um, organizations, how do I do business with the Port of New Orleans? And we've had a big emphasis on small business and female-owned businesses, as well as all local business, so that they have an opportunity, too, to work with the Port of New Orleans. Now, why is New Orleans so successful as a cargo port? You know, in the industry, typically, a shipper chooses a port because it's next to a very large population. I can get my product right to the customer. Or they choose it because there's a big manufacturing or um, distribution centers. That's not necessarily Louisiana, if you think about how we compete in the Gulf. We're right next to Texas. Their population is extraordinarily big compared to ours. The reason we compete is because of the six class ones in the New Orleans public belt. We have access to that entire population through the Midwest all the way up to Canada. And so in essence, it expands our market and expands our reach. And that network is extremely important because we are the only port that gets all six class one railroads to its docks. It's a tremendous advantage. Also, we have a powerful inland waterway, meaning the Mississippi River. We have about 14,000 miles that we can move product up and down the Mississippi primarily through barge and get to states all the way through the Midwest up to Canada. And what that allows as a port, we can offer three different solutions to a shipper. We can truck your goods, we can barge your goods, we can rail your goods. So having that kind of flexibility for their need makes us competitive. So what are our top commodities? From an import standpoint, iron and steel has always been a strong commodity for the port of New Orleans and continues to. Non-ferrous metals, we have LME warehouse designation, basically the London Metals Exchange, where they trade metals, they buy and sell every day, they're stored in warehouses here. What that does is then people say, well, gee, I might as well ship my, my metals through the port since all the warehousing's there. Also a huge supplier, importer of natural rubber. A lot of that goes up to the tire manufacturers um, in the South. And also a huge importer of coffee, and coffee is a great example when we think strategically about how can we grow more jobs in this region is being able to take a product like that and not just move it across our docks, but we roast it, we package it, we warehouse it. Those are all additional jobs. And so really thinking about all these other commodities, can we do that with steel? Could we do that with rubber? So working with our economic development partners across the state to try to find those opportunities and leverage this advantage is a key strategy for the port. We also move uh, tremendous amounts of forest products. Now exports, this is a great example of um, being next to a manufacturing or a distribution center. 
The biggest growth that we've had in containers is because of the chemical, petrochemical plants um, in Baton Rouge and North. Um, they produce tremendous amounts of export plastics and resins. Um, this year on our container side, we broke 500,000 TEUs, and that basically just think boxes. Um, you know, our, our volumes of cargo have doubled in the last 10 years. A big part of this has been this chemical resin boom. Also, we moved tremendous amounts of paper and pulp, and as I mentioned, frozen poultry. Another component of our business is the cruise and tourism business. As I mentioned, uh, we broke the one million mark. Um, the thing about the cruise business, it's not extremely profitable to the port. Um, we get some dockage fees, a passenger fee, but the economic spin-off is huge for, uh, for the cruise business. When you have a home ported ship, you know, people think about passengers coming and going, but those ships have to buy new flowers, buy local food, insurance, linens, dry cleaning, you name it. And um, kind of an industry standard, every home port at call can bring $2 million in economic impact per call. And about 80% of our passengers come from out of state. What's interesting about New Orleans is most passengers want to make it two vacations where they come for two nights before or two nights afterwards. So it drives a lot of hotel room nights um, and a lot of local um, purchasing and tourism activities. We also, and I'm sure you're familiar with these, we also have a number of river cruises and this seems to be a really growing industry. I think Europe has done it well and there's been a lot of interest in cruising up and down the Mississippi from, to St. Louis, Minnesota, Memphis. And we move about 22,000 passengers right now on those river cruises. So to what Dennis was saying, okay, tremendous amount of growth, as I mentioned. The last five or six years have been um, record breaking. You know, it's really hard to keep up with that kind of growth. And I think the real success story and what's great for New Orleans is I think, and we hear this in the industry all the time, was, you know, people didn't know if New Orleans was gonna come back after Katrina. I mean, we've, had, we've doubled the business since that time. We kind of broke the goals that we had for growth, but a lot of our master plan was focused on rebuilding. You know, we had some damaged facilities. We had just opened up the container terminals. We had more um, infrastructure to put in place. So now, really, our focus has been take a step back, and we've got to look 20 years out, particularly on the cargo side, because the ships are getting bigger, um, and that means we need more equipment, we need more space, um, those types of things. So we've really got to be thinking in the long term. So we initiated this process last summer, and the, um, the bulk of the time we spent doing deep market analysis on all of our lines of business to understand where's the business go going, the commodities that we play in right now, will they grow, will they suffer, what other commodities could we be moving? And what that means is, okay, do we have the facilities? If there's that opportunity, we've got to take a look at our current facilities. What do we need to get them ready? And secondly, do we need additional facilities? And that's the process we're in right now. And part of this process was doing a lot of um, engagement with the community, with elected officials, um, to get a good feeling for what is it that you're looking for in terms of the port? Um, what should we be paying attention to? Um, with the local uh, municipal, I call municipalities, parishes. Um, what businesses have you been trying to entice? What industry? Maybe there's a synergy there together um, to help grow those. And a big focus for us has been so many of our facilities are in New Orleans, and as you've seen, the city has grown up around it, that we also have to look to bring opportunity to Jefferson and St. Bernard as well, because this, like I said, is a tremendous economic impact. And are there opportunities in those parishes as well? We hope to have that plan by this fall. Um, we'll be going back out and circling around for additional feedback. We have a survey on our website. Please feel, um, go to it, um, take it. It's something that we're listening every day, continuing to work through this plan. So we're pretty excited about the master plan. So now in terms of priorities, you know, taking over in January, I had the benefit of being the COO for two years, so at least I got a really good feeling for the budget, how do divisions operate, and one of the big things that we've been focused on is obviously we had change at my level, but we've had a lot of management change. About 40% of the organization was um, eligible for retirement. Doesn't mean they were going to do it, but when you have change in leadership, especially after 15 years of an executive director, a lot of people were planning to time with that. 
So over the last two and a half years, we've really had to think about succession planning, what critical positions could walk out the door. And so that's been a, a huge effort. And we have almost a completely um, a great new management team, and it's a blend of individuals with experience in the organization and some new blood. And I think together has really created some energy and a real strategic focus. And we've got to be engaged. We've got to be focused on engaging our employees and making sure that we're in a very effective organization. And from an external standpoint, obviously the master plan is key to what, everything we're looking at and that we're doing. Um, one of the big areas for us is really needing to put in a more proactive maintenance program, um, not being put in the position of uh, responding to a, an equipment failure or an infrastructure failure, but actually doing you know, really strong assessments in programming and budgeting for preventative maintenance every year. So that is a big focus of ours, and that's really caused us to shift some of our capital planning towards maintenance. So right now we're doing a number of projects looking at doing wharf repairs. We operate four bridges that are very old. Um, they need tremendous amounts of maintenance. And so that right now is our big focus. And again, looking at the long-term strategic plan. And because of the cost of this infrastructure, we've got to do it through partnership. We absolutely have to. We all know this, the situation the state is in. There's not a lot of money there. And I have to tell you, as a port, what's a challenge is Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and Texas, they put tremendous amounts of money into their ports and into enticing businesses to come into the state. That's what we have to compete against. So it's really important that we think very creatively about public-private partnerships to stay in that arena. And with that, that's the Port of New Orleans and where we are. This is where um, you can contact us. And again, the master plan survey is online, so we would love it if you would take a minute and um, give us your feedback. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, Ms. Christian, thank you very much. In keeping with the BGR tradition, we do have some questions okay. uh, from, the, uh, from the audience. First of all, how is the Port preparing itself for growing trade, especially with the expansion of the Panama Canal? Mm -hmm. You know, with the Panama Canal, um, what the port is seeing in terms of expansion, we predict about a 7 to 8 percent increase in volumes. Um, mostly what we're seeing is more Asian cargoes, obviously, but we're also seeing a lot more interest in the Gulf as an alternative to the West Coast. Um, you know, they've had some congestion issues, labor issues. Um, I came out of that market, and many shippers are looking for an alternative, and Panama provides that. So we think about 7 to 8 percent growth and, uh, for the next few years, and we'll probably settle around 3 or so percent. But the other thing we're seeing is carriers wanting to bring bigger ships. There was a time when New Orleans thought, we'll never get a ship with you know, more than 4,000, 5,000 TEUs. Well, you know, they're starting to put some of those 8,000 TEU ships into the Gulf. So we have to be focused on, can the facilities handle it? Um, we've got the um, water draft for those size of ships. Um, but we need the equipment at the container terminal, so we have a number of projects where we're upgrading pavement, which is basically allows us to put more boxes and stack them higher, because as you've seen uptown, we're very long, we're linear, and we don't have a lot of space, so we kind of have to stack and be very effective with how we organize our terminals and also additional uh, yard equipment like uh, gantry cranes, additional gantry cranes. So those are really our biggest focus to make sure we could capture that. TEUs, you know, basically just think a container. Okay. So a container, it's a uh, way to measure. You mentioned that uh, the river's deep enough, but is dredging an issue? I mean, I've heard concerns yeah. that uh, you need congressional approval for the Army Corps to do more dredging. Yeah. Is that an issue? We are at 45 feet, and the Army Corps is actually doing the cost study to go to 50 feet. And that's absolutely essential for a couple of reasons. I mentioned the ships are getting bigger. And that's why it's important that we be thinking ahead um, to do that. And some of these ships that come in now, they, they need more uh, draft, especially with the, the, the river goes up and down, that having that extra um, really helps us. But basically, it lets them load the ship a little bit heavier because there's times that they have to do it very light because the draft may be in question. So it's absolutely essential. What are uh, Port of New Orleans competitive advantages and challenges relative to other ports? I think I talked about a few of them um, in terms of um, the cargo business. Um, I mean, when it comes down to ports, geography, and you don't get to change your geography, um, we're, we're pretty lucky in that regard um, from a cargo perspective. 
it's that we're on the Mississippi River. I mean, it really is that we can provide those different options. Um, from a cruise perspective, I think the advantage is, A, there's not a lot of other cruise ports in the Gulf. You've got Galveston, um, you've got you know some over on the southeast of um, Florida, but New Orleans is just very attractive, not only as a place to cruise out of, but because people want to come. So that's a great advantage. And we can offer different itineraries that we're not tied to just one country. We can go over to Belize. We can go to the Bahamas. I mean, we just have variety. Uh, what about the Poland Street cruise terminal idea? We've heard about that for years. Where does that stand? You know, um, with the cruise terminal, I mentioned um, in the presentation that you know, with me coming in, the new management team, we really had to take a step back and prioritize our capital. And right now, we're just really focused on um, rebuilding and investing in maintenance of some piers. Right now, we're focused on doing some um, repairs and preventative maintenance on Nashville Wharf, which is a brake bulk um, cargo terminal. So um, right now, we're focused on, we have a permit in to look at Poland to um, do some upgrades to the wharf and do some maintenance on it. So that's the only thing we funded at this point. Okay. As a tourist center, is there tension in New Orleans regarding the riverfront land use for tourism and development other than traditional port related activities? Sure, absolutely. Um, but it's not unique to um, New Orleans. Um, this is something that every port deals with. You know, the challenge is ports can only operate on water. We, we can't go inland. Um, it was a huge issue in San Diego. Um, people want to be on the water. They want to have access to it. So that naturally creates attention. Um, and if you look at a lot of our f facilities, like you mentioned, they were built from a historical standpoint to move commerce, but neighborhoods grew up around them. So absolutely, that's a tension. And that's part of us needing to have that ongoing conversation because both things impact each other. Um, and so, you know, many countries, many people know how to coexist and make that work, and we just got to make sure we do a better job with that. What about trucking? Are there plans and proposals to improve trucking access? You know, um, trucking is um, a challenge for all ports. Um, a couple of the challenges that we have, one is just um, as an industry, there's a shortage of truckers. So um, that's a big focus in terms of the workforce development is having um, more truckers to service the growth. Um, but in terms of access, there's a couple of things that we've done. You know, as a port, you've got to get through the 10 and the 90, that congestion over by the Superdome. Our trucks have to converse that. Um, Chapatulas is incredibly congested. I drive it every morning to go to work, and it has been an issue for major customers that we've lost business because they've said, uh, you know, we don't know that you can handle it, you know, because we can grow the port in the terminal, but we need the access. So in the last year, we've worked really hard to build a conversation with the state, with the convention center. You know, you have two of the biggest economic engines sitting on the same corridor. And I think there was tension there. And from um, my perspective, Louisiana, New Orleans deserves for both of those to expand. And if you look at the economic impact of that, together we're way more powerful. We can compete for federal funding for highway projects. And really what we need is either a dedicated truck route, you know, a flyover ramp, you know, but those things are, you know, are long down the road. So what we've focused on is improving our gate systems to get uh, people through faster and do moving more boxes by rail and by barge. Several questions from the audience about the Public Belt Railroad. What can you tell us about the role of the Public Belt and the alternatives being considered for its future and what's the port's position on these sure. alternatives? Um, well, as I mentioned, I mean, you, you can see from the slide that having access to the six class ones is essential to what we do. Um, the public belt was created to be that neutral carrier because typically what you'll see in any um, port or industry is that if one class one kind of dominates um, the, uh, the track, that the others are somewhat shut out. And um, they don't, they're not going to worry as much about community impacts and um, those types of issues. So the public belt was created to be the neutral party in between those six class ones. We have a tremendous um, working relationship with them. Um, you know, as I mentioned coming, um, we do P3s all the time. I mean, it's, it's not out of the ordinary to think of that concept. And as a public agency, you absolutely should be looking at your assets. And if they should be, uh, could be more effective, if they could be more valuable. Um, 
the port, the, all of the tenants, the users, and all six class ones, I think, have said very loudly that they believe that the public belt is serving its purpose, that they are very happy with the level of service, um, and that the rates are competitive. Um, so we really don't believe that there's a necessary change there. Can you be more effective? Can you create savings? Absolutely, every government agency should be doing that. Um, but it has you know, been rather disruptive. This has been a dialogue for two years, and it has shut down a lot of business opportunities because people need to know, what rates am I gonna be paying? We have no idea who's gonna own this thing. Um, so a decision has to be made. Um, Fortunately, I think we've been um, had a seat at the table with the city. I think there's been a lot of education on both sides. Um, that led to them making the decision to not sell it, that it's a precious asset. Why would you sell something like that? It's the only one in the entire United States. It, you know, that's a important public access. Um, and our biggest concern is rates. And as I said, we do P3s. We're not against that. But when we do a P3, it's to get a partner, a public-private partnership, so work with a, a private company. We do it so that they bring in capital. They bring in investment to the infrastructure. We do it all the time. You know, this scenario, the current RFP out, is basically to bring in someone that pays out a chunk of money to the city and doesn't put it back into the system, but you can ask the system to repay that 50, 60 million dollars and what would 50, 60 million dollars do for the public belt? I mean, you could automate things, you could do signage. I mean, there's so many things that you could do with that money. And so our voice has been, hey, we need to have a program where it's about putting money into the belt and not taking it out. How important is the replacement of the industrial canal lock and long-term growth of the Port of New Orleans? You know, that's, that's a new one for me. Coming from the West Coast, having to come up to speed on locks is uh, amazing. Um, you know, there's a long history to that project. What we've been focused on is, you know, the port's no longer the federal sponsor of the lock. We had supported it through um, a users group with community members and with tenants to um, focus on a shallow lock. It had a better cost-benefit ratio. And for us, really, the importance on the lock is the new bridge because of um, the St. Claude Bridge, as I mentioned, it's 100 years old. Um, it really need, it does not provide for any pedestrian or bicycle access. So for us, the importance of the project we've really focused on is the replacement of that bridge. Any timetable on that? I don't, I don't know. We'd have, you have to ask the Army Corps. They're going through their studies now. I don't know what timeline they've put out. So you mentioned four bridges. That's one of them? Or yeah. Of the uh, Florida Avenue, Alamaster, and Seabrook. Uh, a lot of security measures Yeah, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, after 9-11, ports, kind of like airports, became a very big focus. Um, there's a number of federal requirements and programs that are put in place um, to assure that security, everything from customs checking, radiation portals, um, only badge individuals with credentials can access the terminal. Um, so all of those are in place. We also have a small harbor police force um, that also provides security around the terminals. Uh, what about the Avenue of Shipyards facility? Where does that stand in terms of what uh, the future holds? You know, that is a um, piece of land that the port, a number of parties, has looked at. Um, you know, it's not very often that 200 plus acres opens up on the Mississippi. Um, the challenge with that project has been one, don't really know what the environmental situation is. It was um, a shipyard, um, but also the asking price has been very high and they want to sell it as one piece versus a lot of people were interested in 20 acres here, 20 acres there. So the concept in, that the port has looked at is that's what we do is we're a master developer and we piece these types of tenancies together. Um, so we've done a lot of analysis on that side and have been talking to um, private companies that are interested in either cargo activities or some type of light manufacturing there. Um, so if we could bring together enough parties and bring in some private money, that's what it's going to take. We don't have you know, that amount of money. We don't, the state definitely doesn't have it, is that we've got to find some private sector partners that could help open a project like that. Tony Leachy of the Jefferson Business Council asks if you have any specific opportunities in that location. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, there's been um, 
multiple different um, interested parties. Um, when we look at it from a port maritime side, because of the Huey P. Long Bridge, we really can't do a container terminal down there. It needs to be what we call break bulk, um, which is just things that move in kind of bags and pallets. So some of the things I, I mentioned in our slide, um, you know, that there's definitely been parties that are interested in that type of activity. Um, the key for us is the back of the property has a number of very high-end uh, warehouses, equipment, machinery shops, and can we find a tenant? For example, we move a lot of steel. If we bring steel across the dock, could we find a tenant that would want to do some manufacturing of the steel in some of those facilities? Um, so we've had different interested parties, and the key is can we match them up and bring them together? Do you see coastal land loss uh, prices there as a threat to Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it impacts the navigation of um, the Mississippi and um, the community. It's, it's something we have to be focused on. Okay. How does the, uh, your growth prediction impact the industrial canal expansion proposal? This comes from Lois Adams of Justice and Justice. Of impact the... Your growth, uh, the expansion of the uh, industrial canal. Um, you know, the industrial canal is interesting. This all precedes me. Um, is once upon a time the container terminals were out on the industrial canal and as I said the ships were getting bigger so a lot of those facilities were moved to uptown um, to Napoleon and the re-envisioning of the canal for us has really been those value-added services um, in, in shallow draft smaller boats I'll say um, try, I always try not to use port technical jargon um, but uh, get the smaller draft boats back there and really to do a lot of value added types of things like warehousing, packaging. You're seeing companies like that, like TCI. Um, one of the big things we're looking at is can we use the industrial canal and um, use rail and barge to move boxes that way instead of um, along the highway. So it really is um, kind of tied and integral to the services we provide at the cargo terminals. A member of the audience is asking how much port revenue is dedicated to fighting the you know, um, port revenue isn't directly um, assigned to that. There's federal programs and fees that are captured um, in, through the Army Corps that don't directly come from the Port of New Orleans. Economic development, we're talking about quality jobs at the Port of New Orleans. What kinds of jobs and what kinds of uh, salaries uh, does the Port have? You know, um, it varies. Um, you've got a lot of um, positions that are more, you know, work in the ships, work in the barges, truck drivers. Um, you have professional level salaries of freight forwarders, um, brokers that are actually booking and moving the, um, the cargo. So it's a complete mix of type of jobs, and which is great. Um, you've got a lot of service industry level jobs, particularly on the cruise industry side. Um, the, uh, but that's what's nice about it is it creates kind of different sectors. Oh gosh, the pay ranges could be anything from you know thirty thousand to I think the average was like fifty-seven thousand is the average income. How does the Port of New Orleans uh, use an evident domain to protect the same rights to waterfront property as the Port of Saint Bernard recently mm -hmm. exercised in their jurisdictions? And do you have any plans to use that? Yeah, the um, the port I, the, and this was definitely something a little bit different in Louisiana for me is there's something called the servitude, and that is a port authority in your jurisdiction, if you had a need to use that waterfront frontage, that um, you would um, be able to invoke the servitude. And in many cases, the land ownership uh, may not be the port. It may be a private or entity or the city. From my knowledge, I don't think the port's ever used eminent domain. Um, it's not something that we'd want to get into. I mean, if you look at what happened in St. Bernard, you end up in a lot of litigation. And I mean, What's the point? You spend 10 years in court, you can't use the property anyway. So I think it's just much better, you know, to approach it directly. You mentioned in your presentation that the port needs more space. So where do you need that space? What kind of space and for what purpose? Um, you know, in terms of space, um, thinking mostly on the cargo side is just having uh, more acreage to move more goods. Um, a lot of it is on the container side. Um, one of the things we've really focused on is a port is, you know, sometimes a port will say, we're going to take all the land we have and convert it to container space, and we're going to get out of these other businesses. Um, about 50% of our business is containers, and 50% is non-containerized, some of those break bulk, and we think it's important to have both. 
So, you know, we're pretty proud that we haven't cannibalized the brake bulk space. So that means, you know, we've got the footprint that we've got, at least at the, the um, existing terminals. Right now, we move about 500,000 boxes, if you will. We have capacity with the current footprint to move about 800,000. And with further investments in equipment and concrete and paving, you could go to a million and a half. So it's really making those investments in the terminal to make it um, on the same footprint to make it more effective. Competitively, what is the port doing to attract more cruise line business? You know, we market to um, the cruise lines all the time. Um, you know, like I said, part of it is the geography. It's the performance of the cruise industry here um, that attracts them. Um, our, my big focus has been, you know, about 70% of our business is with Carnival. Um, I'd like more diversity in that, um, not only from a standpoint of, um, you know, if they decide decided to leave, that impacts us pretty um, pretty widely. So having the region, we just announced having Royal Caribbean, but I'd also like to have a variety of offerings like, um, you know, some of the other cruise lines that have a clientele that are family-oriented, um, different age populations, just so there's more variety and options for the different um, demographics that we may have in the city or from our market. So we've been focused on that. You talk about dockage fees. Um, tell us about the dockage fees. That's where, that's where the future road, right? Mm -hmm. What are the dockage fees? How much, how much do these, uh, these, these ships pay? The oh, you know, it varies so much um, between um, a cruise um, um, vessel to different types of cargo vessels. It's usually based on their length. So basically they pay us basically to be able to park, if you will, at our wharf. Um, they will pay wharfage, meaning they're gonna use our land side or the wharf. And um, then they have a lot of fees that go to the terminal operators that move the boxes for them, um, et cetera. And then we also collect money for the gantry cranes. We provide the cranes and they pay us by the hour um, to use that equipment. So dockage fees range from? Oh, gosh. Um, I've never looked at a, a but per... But a cruise yeah. would No, no. It's a, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's the, the length. And they also have... Um, they pay directly for the pilots to bring them up and down the river. That doesn't go to the port directly. Uh, you mentioned repairs necessary at the Poland Street Wharf. What, what, what's the condition of that wharf? Um, you know, the condition of the wharf is, you know, if you think about a number of the facilities across the port, um, like I mentioned, Nashville, is we always have to constantly go in there and look at basically their pile support, their long piles that go into the water, and those can get um, rusted, corroded, so we have to constantly go in there proactively before we have a, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, a depleted pile. So we go in all the time and say, okay, you know, it's time to repair this pile, that pile, um, it's got some rust on it, so we do different things. Um, and with that project, that's what we'll be doing, is replacing some pilings, putting coating on some pilings to make sure that they don't rust, um, just like you would anything that you have outside to protect it from the rain. And if you do develop that into a cruise port, what's, what's going to be done with the traffic going through that area? Well, I think that has to be a big part of the, um, if we were, wherever we do a cruise terminal, I mean, we, we deal with that right now at our existing cruise terminals, is we really have to do a lot of study, uh, work with the community, studies about what is the most effective um, traffic flow for any facility. All right. Ms. Christian, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Speaking with us today. Thank you. And thanks again to Iberia Bank for its generous sponsorship of this breakfast briefing series. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We hope this event has been informative. If you use the Slido app or website to submit questions today, please click on the polls tab to rate that technology. Thanks again for being here. Hope you have a great day.